Hello everyone, this is Dikshak Bhatt from Team OYG. On behalf of Team, I welcome you all again in another interesting session. Today we have a wonderful speaker all the way from Singapore and uh, USA. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Kevin with us. Uh, today's topic is the food as a medicine. Dr. Kevin was born and took his primary education in China. He graduated with a degree of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery from the University of Singapore. He did the residency in obstetrics, gynecology, pediatrics, and followed by a short period of an emergency medicine. His interest in how drugs worked led his appointment to the assistant lecturer at the University of Singapore, then rose to the rank of lecturer and senior lecturer. Also the associate, associate professor of pharmacology, uh, Sir was awarded as a Markship Dome and International Fellowship in Clinical Pharmacology. At the same time, he was also awarded to Overseas Scholarship by the University of Singapore. Further, he was conferred the degree of the Doctor of Philosophy by the University of London and his research on the dynamics on the rain and angiotensin system. Apart from this, Sir has worked in many countries like Australia and USA and shared his knowledge and wisdom to, uh, to continue his research, uh, Sir turned the interest as a food as medicine because the food medicine has a common origin. So today, on behalf of our team, I welcome you, Sir, on this virtual platform. And I would like you to take over and further give us our give your knowledge to us. Thank you so much, Sir, for joining with us. Uh, Mr. Basar, can you please put on the slide? Sure, Sir. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Oh, yes, I can see it very well now. Thank you. Well, my name is uh, Kevin Ng. I'm an internist as well as a pharmacologist. I am interested in food as medicine for the last 15 to 20 years because I found that whatever I had uh, pioneered in or developed did not cure the root of the problem of the patients. And when I turned 60, I asked myself, what have I done in the field of medicine? And that brought me to food as medicine. Now, can I have the next slide, please? Next. Now, I am trying to make it as brief as possible and make it as simple as possible for your audience. Next, please. Next slide, please. Now, what is food and what is medicine? Food is a nourishing substance that is taken into the body to sustain life, provide energy and promote growth. And medicine is the science of a practice of the diagnosis, treatment and prevention of a disease. Next. Now, the origin of food as medicine is stretched over the last 5,000 years. Let's start from the beginning. Shenlong is said to be the father of Chinese medicine. He lived about 5,000 years ago. He taught the farmers how to plow the land, how to grow their fruit and so on. Now he himself was said to have uh, two horns on the head and to have a transparent abdominal wall so that whatever he ate can be seen in the stomach and the intestine. All in all, he tested about 365 herbs, including plants, minerals, and animal products. And all his results were compiled about 2,000 years later into a classic. Next slide, please. And in this book, it is called the classic of herbal medicine, and that was published about 2,000 years ago. In that book, he classified foods according to the flavors, according to what the nature affects the body. And most important of all, he classified the herbs into three categories. The superior category is, uh, consists of herbs or food good for health. The medium one is slightly toxic and the inferior group is supposed to be toxic and that should be used only for disease treatment. And then 
he started off with this theory how drugs work. And that is about 35,000 years ago. His theory was that there should be a main drug, which we call sovereign drug. And it should be supplemented with uh, two or three ministers and a few assistants and envoys. That's how the, he, uh, he hypothesized how the drugs work in the body. In fact, in those days, we don't know anything how drugs work. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, out of all the herbs that he tasted, in the, in the third category of uh, herbs that he, he tested, he mentioned one of the herbs called artisanum annuum. And from this herb was isolated a chemical that is now used uh, uh, in Africa to treat all the malaria uh, patients uh, affected with malaria. And every year, this chemical saves about a few millions of lives. And for this work, the doctor who discovered it and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and pioneered in this field was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015. Next slide, please. Now, next we come to the Western medicine, the father of medicine. This is about 2,000 years, uh, 2000 years ago. Hippocrates is known as a father of Western medicine. He was the one who propo proposed a theory how disease uh, come about. He proposed a theory of uh, bile, yellow bile, black bile, the phlegm and the blood. Now this is old theory in those days, nobody knew about germs, nobody knew about hygiene and so on. But what he has done was that he separated the disease from the religious belief. And from his work and his teaching and his practice, he came up with a good and very famous proverb. It says, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. Next. Now, I went to find out what actually he used you know, for his patients among the herbs that he used, he used frankincense and mirth. These were, uh, these were the gifts given to Jesus Christ uh, by the three kings. And among all the, uh, all the herbs that he used, I was surprised that he even tried uh, marijuana. But the most important discovery he made was that he used the bark of the white willow tree. And, and from that, he used the bark to treat people with fever, with pain, and ladies with dysmenorrhea. Now, this was about nearly 2,000 years ago. Now, next slide, please. Now, from, from the, the results produced by the white willow or bark, you know, uh, we found that he actually tested many, many parts of the plants, like the leaf, the flower, the bark, the seed, the root, and the raisin. And it was only out of the buck that he used the he used a white willow to treat the fever. And what is this? And white willow buck becomes the foundation of aspirin. Let's let's see how it came about. Next, please. Now, the aspirin that we all of us take for fever, for pain, and so on, come a long way. Now it was only in the 19, in 1897, when uh, the active component in the bark was isolated by Hoffman. Now he isolated this chemical called salicylate acid in the white willow bark. And he gave it to his father who was suffering from arthritic pains. But this pill gave him a lot of side effects. So he told us, he told Hoffman to reduce the uh, side effect on it. So that came out with a pill, aspirin, and we use it for the last uh, 87, nearly 120 years. So aspirin has been in, in use for 170, for 120 years. But nobody knows how aspirin works until in the late 60s when I was in London. Next slide, please. Now, my teacher, John Vane, uh, called me one 
uh, morning and said, can you set up a simple apparatus for me? I just want to test my idea. If aspirin works by preventing the formation of a group of chemicals we call prostaglandins. He sat down in the, in the lab where I worked and in less than one hour, he produced three graphs. He said, I know how aspirin works. And then he got a Nobel Prize for that in the year 1982. Next, please. Next. Now, now we come back to the questions about food. Have you ever asked yourself, why do we eat? Next, please. Why do we eat? And Socrates, the philosopher said, thou should eat to live and not live to eat. So what do we do? We eat all kinds of garbage in the world. So this is how it was done. In the year, from the year 1800 to 1900, uh, people all over the world think that if they eat enough of protein, carbohydrate, fats, and, and, and minerals, they should be all right. The answer is no. How do we find it? We found that during the famine, what happened? People are starved to death. Next, please. Now, even if you eat all of enough of protein, carbohydrates, and so on, you think you are healthy. The answer is no. Because from the famine, we found that people still die. And in the so-called developed countries, when you full free yourself with all these things, you still have uh, a lot of uh, uh, nutrient uh, deficiency. Now, this is known for quite a while, you know. And uh, <clears throat> in the year 1900 to the 1950, those 50 years were the golden years for the discovery of amino acids. Now, out of all the work done by the nutritionists, the pharmacologists, the physiologists, and the physicians, and the epidemiologists, in the five in 50 years, from 1900 to 1950, uh, next slide, please. Back, back, I'm sorry. Next, go back. Yes, the, in the, in, in the, in the five, 50 years, from 1900 to the 1950s, amino acids were discovered. It was about nine. These nine amino acids were not produced by the body. If you are short of it, you get into trouble like for example, skin, the eyes, neurotransmission, and so on. The classic example of deficiency in one of the uh, essential items like in vitamin B1 is the disease, what we call beriberi, or we know it as right heart failure. Now, uh, the word vitamins come by accident. At first, the scientists thought that they were working on amino acids, and that's why they call it vital, a means, but now we know that uh, the word vitamins is a combination of two words, you know, vital and A means. Now, the, another classic example of a vitamin is uh, vitamin C, which leads to scurvy if, uh, if there's not enough scurvy in the system. Now, in the later 50 years, from 1950 to the year 200, two other nutrients have been discovered. And these are the essential fatty acids like omega-3 and omega-6. And a few years later, dietary fibers were also found to be essential for a good health. But unfortunately, in America, 90% or more of the people are taking not enough dietary fibers. So that led to a lot of a problem problems like irritable bowel syndrome and uh, colitis and so on and so forth. But what is more important in the last 40 years was that doctors found that even if you feed the patients with all the stuff in the world, they still have a problem, problem like chronic inflammatory disease, like obesity, uh, heart trouble, uh, stroke, uh, autoimmune disease and cancer. So they are turning attentions to the chemicals in plants. We call it phytochemicals. Now, phytochemicals are very small, are needed only a small amount in the, in the diet. If a person weighs about two, uh, about 60 kilos, and he assumes he uh, consumes a diet made up of 470 grams, 
the total amount of essential uh, items, including phytochemicals, is less than 3%. So the 3% make a person's health so-called optimal. Now, what I'd like to talk about more is, is that what are phytochemicals? Next slide. Next. Next slide. Now, phytochemicals uh, come from the word phyto, and chemicals are compounds that occur not naturally in plants. There are about 5,000 phyto phytochemicals, but only 150 have been studied extensively. Next. Now, you don't have to look at this complicated uh, structure. The classification of phytochemicals is very complex. All I need to, to, you to know is a few good phytochemicals. Next. Now, a few simple classification of phytochemicals include carotenoids, phenolics, and the organ, organ sulfur compounds. Next. Now, example of some carotene is uh, your carrot, uh, tomato, and that give you a bit beta carotene that is essential for the eyes or like vitamin A. Now the phenolics can be divided into two separate groups. This is a very in, important group. I want you to st study more about the phenolics. There's one group called non flavonoids and this is found in the uh, red wine. Uh, it comes from the skin and the seed of the Concord black seeds. Now the other important group of phytochemicals is Flavonoids, there's a big group of this. In this group, you have quercetin, which is a bioactive compound from the apple. Then you have got the flavonoids, which comes from green tea. This is a very important uh, uh, chemical here. Then you have fla flavonoids called hesperidin. Now, hesperidin is present in large quantities in the fresh crushed orange juice. Now recently it was found that this chemical would block the entry of COVID-19 virus into the system. Then you have anthocyanins. This comes from the blueberries, blackberries, anthocyanides, and so on and so forth. Now, there's another group, iso flavonoids, which come from uh, like soybean. Uh, then the sulfur compounds is made of uh, is made of that. So the question now is. What are these phytochemicals? What do they do? Now they have two functions. They work in the plants and they act as antioxidants against a strong UV light. They act as a hormone and they also protect the plants from the microorganisms. Uh, Next please. Next. But in human, this is how the idea came about. A lot of uh, scientists thought that if the plant can survive in nature, it must have some, something good in them. Why can't we make use of some of these products in our system you know, to remove the free radicals from us, to reduce the inflammations, to modulate the inflammatory process and to prevent us from growing, from, uh, growing old. Now, next please. Now, what effect have phytochemicals got uh, in us? Then we have to ask a question that as a doctors, we have to find out what is the main cause of death all over the world. Now, seven out of 10 leading causes of death in 2019 were non-communicable. And these seven causes accounted for 44% of all deaths or 80% of the top 10 diseases. Now, next thing is we have to find out how long people live. Uh, uh, what do they die from? Ten lead, of all the 10 leading causes of death in the United States in 2018, number one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. Now, it's very strange. This, they are these two causes are the leading causes of death in the, in the United States. The next question I ask myself is, we have all the facilities, all the best medicines in the world. How long do the Americans live? Next, please. This is, shows the life expectancy of the world population you know, ranked by life, expect, ex, life expectancy. You know who are the people who live the longest in the world? 
if you look at the chart, apparently it's the people who live in Hong Kong and Japan. Now, I come from Singapore, uh, and Singapore ranked number five. Let's say the, the people who live the longest in the world is 85 uh, in Hong Kong. In Singapore, it's 84. United States, 79. It ranked 46. They rank number 46. In India, it's much lower. In India's life expectancy is only 70 years. So if you compare the life expectancy of uh, people in India with the people in Hong Kong, they live shorter by nearly 15 years of their life. So there's a problem in India. So we we'll look at it. So with all the knowledge that we have, how do we eat and what do we eat? Why we eat? Now, with all the uh, uh, figures work out for essential amino acids, vitamins, uh, then uh, omega, the omega-3 and omega-6 and all, uh, and the dietary fat. Now, all these figures had been established by the United States. Then they came up with the idea that you should eat more of fruit and vegetables. What do they mean? Fruit and vegetables, half of the plate. The other half should be divided uh, between grains and protein. So all this has been already in work out, but a simple uh, explanation is that you should eat according to, you should eat more than half of your plate should be fruit and vegetable. vegetable. The emphasis now is on fruits and vegetables. Now, what is the evidence for that? Next slide, please. Now, the evidence in the literature has shown that fruits and vegetables reduce the number of cardiovascular disease and also prevent a lot of chronic disease and probably also reduce the cancer risk. Now, let's look at all the studies that we had uh, seen in the literature and sum it up and see what are the benefits of fruit and vegetable. Next slide, please. Now, this is a composite slide uh, showing the support of vegetables and fruits in the prevention of a chronic disease. Now, definitely, the convincing evidence definitely is found in high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke. This has been proven over and over again. And the uh, and uh, about cancer, the, it's more on the yes side, more on the yes side. Now, pro possible benefit is also found in almost all other kinds of a disease. So this, we don't know exactly what are the chemicals in the fruit and vegetables to, to do all this because there are about 5,000 chemicals and it is almost impossible to study every one of them. So what I personally is that I selected those fruits and vegetables that, <clears throat> that are supposed to be beneficial for health and find out what other active components are. In many cases, I found that uh, those fruits and vegetables that are beneficial for health are usually those with potent antioxidant properties and very powerful anti-inflammatory uh, properties. So I suspect that the benefits come from these two, this two, uh, uh, this two, uh, these properties from the phytochemicals. And uh, over the years, I have been uh, testing uh, patients and uh, using my knowledge how to improve the life uh, without using too much medications. When I was had a semi-retired uh, position, I, I was asked to teach the young doctors how to treat the patients. Because when I was in a group of about 20 internists, at the end of the year, the analysis showed that I used the least drug and my hospital, my patient were admitted least into the hospital. So I was asked to give them lectures on how to handle patients in the right way. Most of the time, I would say 90 to 99% of the time, we doctors are treating only symptoms. We are not treating the root of the disease. So this is why I was very 
adamant that patients should lose the weight. If they lose the weight, a lot of a problem could be solved, like uh, hypertension, uh, probably heart failure, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, all this so-called non-communicable non -communicable disease is actually due to the wrong lifestyle that includes a lack of sleep, lack of exercise, eating the wrong food, you know, and so on and so forth. All right, that will make the uh, topic of another webinar. Let's go on to the next slide. The question commonly asked by my patients and friends and doctors and so on, what if I take all the phytochemical supplements uh, can I be healthy as you think? Next slide, please. Now, the question is no, no, no. Now, this is the story. When I was in Glasgow, I went into the hotel. I was a bit thirsty and I opened the tap and the water was so good, so clear. Every, I just drink and drink and drink and drink. Then I asked my colleagues, I said, why the water in Glasgow uh, Scotland is so wonderful, so tasty. So he told me the story that a group of Japanese scientists went to Glasgow, collected the water and analyzed using the latest analytical instrument to find out what they are, what, what it contains and so on and so forth. Then they came up with a final product. It still doesn't taste like Johnny Walker. So the, the, the implication of the story is that one plus one is not equal to two. You have to take the whole thing. Next slide. Well, summary, I would just like to sum up by saying that food as medicine is known for more than 5,000 years. Uh, ancient wisdom revealed that food is essential for life. But however, the discoveries of essential nutrients is not known until the early 1990s. The essential amino acids, vitamins, fatty acids, and dietary fibers are now well established. And the role of the phytochemicals in the maintenance of health is now actively being pursued. Next slide. Now, this is, the, this is a very famous proverb I like to say. When the diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. When the diet is correct, medicine is of no need. Thank you very much. Any questions, you could uh, email me and my email address is uh, shown here. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful presentation you gave and it was a, such okay. an informative session. Uh, we really enjoyed the session and there are lots and lots of, you know, uh, the information you give about from the beginning of the history and the way you laid the session was really interesting. I enjoyed myself a lot and I hope that all the listeners and viewers also enjoyed the session. So one thing I wanted to ask that uh, from seeing your profile, you have uh, served uh, so many countries. So, so and even uh, now you, you are, you keep going on learning and researching. So, sir, how you yourself going on with this subjects, you know, because even I myself studying sometimes feel hard to study. So how you keep yourself going on studying? Well, learning is a lifelong process, you know, and if you're trained as a doctor and as a scientist, you never stop learning. Now, right now, I'm, I, 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 I begin to realize that we doctors are not very well taught in the way we eat, in the way you know, we eat, we exercise. So now new, the new things that come out of the years of research is that exercise is medicine. In those days, I remember when I was a medical student, if a patient has a heart attack, the patient is placed on the bed and on the bed is hang a note, C-R-I-B, complete rest in bed. But nowadays, no, no, no. The moment you come in a heart attack, we stabilize you, take the pain off, get out and walk. So that is, you see how, how things change over the last 50 years. A lot of yeah. like hip surgery. We used to hang up 
a patient with a fractured hip, six months in the hospital. And now uh, we fix up the fracture. Next, next day, rehab, walk. See, we learned so much over the last 50, 50 years. And I'm glad that I was taught by some of the best doctors, best scientists in the world. You know? So I assimilate all their ideas and came up with my own. You know? So I'm still learning, still practicing some medicine. So that's a great because, you know, you just give us such an inspiration that uh, even at your age, we should keep going and going and learning because nowadays we can't have a much strength like you. And uh, what you did is was such an, a great motivation to us, all of us. So even I myself try that in the future, I would um, just reach out to your stage. At least I can achieve the sum of your achievements. Then it would be also great for me because I, I don't think myself can go on further like this. <laughs> well, whatever it is, keep, keep learning. Well, I, I so, thank you, Mr. Vassal, for this webinar. It's a, it's a pleasure for me you know, to disseminate my knowledge. Sure, sir. It, it was actually, we are glad that you connected with us and we give, uh, we get the opportunity to listen to you and learn from you. So we would like you to, in future as well, that uh, if we get a time and if we meet up in personally, so that we could uh, arrange a session for you here in person as well. And uh, if uh, this was such a great, because of COVID-19, we could not arrange the yeah. session, and but still online, we get an opportunity to talk with you is such a great for us. So one question is from last question from my side. So any suggestions or anything you would to give to all the uh, aspiring doctors like me? Any suggestion or tips because your experience is vulnerable for all of us. Well, to be a doctor is a fascinating uh, career. You know? I enjoy every bit of it and keep your mind open that whatever the textbook tells you is only half right in many cases. Like for example, uh, Way back about 50 years ago, when the angiotensin was discovered, and uh, they thought that it was a plasma enzyme. So everybody took it for granted, it's a plasma that plays an important part. But when I went to London and learned a little bit more about this new technique uh, developed by John Vane, I said, let me put a coil outside the body and see the circulating blood will do anything or not. I found that the rate of conversion from the inactive compound to the active compound is too long. It takes too long. Whereas when you give it intravenously and the stuff that came out from the uh, pulmonary vein is so active, it's only a matter of five seconds. That changed the whole idea, the whole idea about medicine. And then with co my colleagues and I, uh, we found the ACE inhibitors, we found the thromboxane, uh, we found how aspirin works, and, uh, and my colleague later on found the nit nit uh, nit uh, nitrous oxide, the NO, you know, how it was developed, how it became a neurotransmitter, and so on. So if you keep your mind open, you know, medicine is wonderful. Like now I found that a lot of food that we eat contains phytochemicals, but they are not absorbed into the system. So I'm just you know, working on that, see any other way I could enhance it. Like for example, if you take the turmeric, now turmeric has a compound called curcumin and then four others, none of it is absorbed into the system. But we found that if you take pepper with it, pepper will help it to, to be absorbed five, about five times more into the system. That will provide some of the therapeutic effects. You know? Totally, sir. I would agree with your point. And uh, still, I'm, you know, today we, you gave us such a great session that we learned a lot of things and a lot of inspiration from you. So uh, as uh, you suggested, we would, I would try to keep up my mind and I wish that everyone who is hearing right now will also follow your guidance and tips. Sir. Thank you so much, sir, once again for joining with us and giving us your valuable time. We are glad that we could connect with you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Mm.